Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ling Zheng Wang. I teach uh, Chinese literature and film in the Department of East Asian Studies. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to today's talk. Um, as some of you already know, uh, this is the first event of the uh, Yale of China uh, film series, uh, which explores the history and art of Chinese cinema in different periods and geographical locations. The film series includes uh, three major events, one in September and uh, two in November. Um, and it's sponsored by East Asian Studies, the Office of International Affairs, and the Yale of China. Many people have offered their general help, generous help to the film series. Here I would like to particularly thank you, uh, thank uh, Shayna Weinberg, the Yale of China coordinator, and Melina Pecker, uh, program coordinator in East Asian Studies, for their great assistance in organizing uh, the film series. Their tireless efforts and uh, creative talents are deeply appreciated. Now, let me introduce to you uh, Shelley Stevenson, who will offer brief uh, opening remarks. Shelley is the Director of International Initiatives in the International Affairs Office at Brown. She received her PhD in East Asian Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago, and her primary academic research has been in the area of Chinese film history with a focus on Japanese-occupied Shanghai, uh, 19, from 1937 to 1945. Formerly Brown's assistant provost, Shelley has played a key role in Brown's internationalization activities since 2006. She has helped initiate and uh, coordinate a range of partnerships and programs on campus and around the world. As many of us here well know, Shelley has also being a great promoter and supporter of China-related cultural exchanges and uh, academic events at Brown. Uh, we are extremely delighted that she's able to join us today and to give introductory remarks. Thank you again. Hi. Uh, I'm Shelley Stevenson. I'm very happy to represent the Office of International Affairs and to welcome you to this first event of the uh, China Through the Lens film series. Uh, the Office of International Affairs is thrilled to have helped support through its curriculum fund uh, the course which is tied to this film series um, and even more so to be sponsoring the Year of China in this 2011-12 academic year. Uh, Year China's faculty director, coordinator, uh, executive committee, and faculty from all across campus have been uh, collaborating for about a year now um, to put together a whole year's worth of activities and events introducing, celebrating, and examining Greater China. In particular, for our purposes tonight, uh, Professor Ling Jin Wong has created what promises to be a very exciting film series, uh, bringing together three very well-known scholars of Chinese film who, following screenings, will present lectures covering diverse periods and aspects of Chinese cinema. As a recovering academic myself, who once spent countless numbers of hours in graduate school watching and uh, reading about and discussing uh, early 20th century Chinese cinema, uh, I must say that I'm especially honored tonight to be present for this first talk by Christine Harris on Shanghai cinema behind the scenes. It was wonderful for me to have the chance to see for the first time the, fi uh, the film uh, Two Stars, and I know that last night there was a screening of one of my very favorite films, Center Stage. Uh, we look forward to hearing Professor Harris discuss these films, and of course, we look forward to uh, the further events in the series in the weeks to come. Uh, and now I think to introduce the speaker in greater detail, uh, Professor Wang, we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Uh, Christine Harris is an Associate Professor of History and Director of the Asian Studies Program at the uh, State University of New York at New Paltz. She has also recently served twice as a visiting Associate Professor in Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. Professor Harris is a distinguished scholar in Chinese cinema 
Chinese Film Studies, and has published extensively on Chinese cinema, particularly early Chinese cinema. She received her PhD from the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at Columbia University, and her research focused on the uh, contentious political, economic, and aesthetic interests behind representations of the modern nation in China's silent and early sound films. Professor Harris was also among the first to critically tackle complex issues concerning gender cinema and the metropolitan Shanghai in the Republic era. She has a distinguished list of publications on the topic, but here, for the sake of time, I just want to quickly point out that her 1997 article, The New Woman Incident, Cinema Scandal and Spectacle in 1935 Shanghai, has had an enormous impact on research and teaching in Chinese gender and film studies. Professor Harris' research interests and scholarship also extend to Chinese cinema of later periods. Her recent publications include Modern Mulans, Reimagining the Mulan Legend in Chinese Film, 1920s to 1960s, and Remakes slash Remodels, The Red Detachment Woman in Chinese Hong Sen Niang Zijun, Between Stage and Screen. Her talk today, Shanghai, Shanghai Cinema Behind the Scenes, is part of another project, some of which will come out later this year in the book History in Images, History Through Images, Entertainment, Media, and Public Space, edited by Christian Harrier, mm -hmm. Harrier? Okay. and uh, uh, Wen Xingye, forthcoming by the uh, University of California Press. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Harris. Thank you, Ling Jen, and thank you, Shelley, for your warm introduction, your very generous introduction. And I'm so happy to be here tonight to talk about uh, Shanghai cinema behind the scenes. Can you hear me out in the, in the back? Prefer this? Is that better? Okay, great. Okay. W.J.T. Mitchell, in his book Picture Theory, suggests that meta pictures function as a kind of, uh, function to quote explain what pictures are to stage, as it were, the very self knowledge of pictures, much the way idols fetishes, and magic mirrors seem not only to have a presence, but a life of their own, looking and talking back at us. Stanley Kwan's 1992 film Center Stage is one kind of meta picture, a biographical film staging the life, work, and death of the legendary screen star Running Yu along with the very history of Chinese cinema itself, as he pieces together fragments from the past and, through Maggie Chung, breathes life into the silent films and still images of the actress that remain. Today, I'd like to take us back to an earlier generation of meta picture made in 1931 Shanghai called Two Stars, or Two Stars on the Silver Screen, Yin Han Shuang Xing. This was a movie about the making of movies, and specifically about the making of Chinese movies, in an era where the very character and future of Chinese cinema was a subject of great debate. Two stars told the story of a talented young woman who sings so well that she's discovered and elevated to stardom by a fictional movie suit studio called the Yin Han Film Company. Not only did the film present the actress's performances for stage and screen and the surrounding backstage dramas, but it also self-reflexively dramatized key aspects of the process of pre-production, filming, and promotion. The rise of recorded music and sound film played an important part in the film Two Stars. This was the first foray into sound filmmaking for the newly established Lianhua Film Company in Shanghai, and like so many early sound films in China and the US around 1930 and 31, it was a musical. 
Lin Hua was so proud of their accomplishment that the, tri that the triumph of synchronized sound was actually even foregrounded as a climactic point in the film. In reality, though, Two Stars was a hybrid film that employed both silent and sound filmmaking practices. The dialogue and narrative exposition were still presented with intertitles, while a musical soundtrack was recorded on discs for playback during screenings to be cued to the on-screen musical performance at various points within the film. Now, I'd like to point out that the soundtrack on the version that uh, circulates today and the one that you would have seen uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, uh, it sounds very nice, but it's actually not the original soundtrack. Uh, I've been working on actually reconstructing uh, the original sound elements of the film through archival materials and contemporary descriptions so we can understand how significant the original songs actually were for the film's plot and meaning. So I'll mention a few of those uh, at points tonight, and if you're interested in details about the film's sound, uh, please, uh, you'll find them in the uh, piece that's coming out. Two stars could be considered part of a genre of fictional and filmic representations of the movie world circulating through cinemas and print media, not just in China, but also globally during the 1920s and 30s. Chinese film companies made numerous pictures about Shanghai's film industry with titles like the female movie star, the emotional actress, an amorous history of the silver screen, and a female star, just to name a few. And all of those are from 1928 to 33. In the same period, behind the scenes movies and backstage musicals were also being imported to China from Hollywood. So here are two examples, show, show, or here's a, so an example from one, Showgirls in Hollywood. There are others uh, such as Show People made in 1928. Alongside these films, Chinese magazines and book publishers brought out short stories and novels about movies, casting real-life notables as characters. Dramatizing the new culture that was embodied by movie stars and the new technologies magnif that magnified and amplified them, these works shaped and directed the public fascination with cinema and drew attention to the film medium itself as a form of cosmopolitan modernity. The film Two Stars was based on a serialized story with the, by the same title uh, by the popular butterfly fiction author Zhang Hanshui. Published in 1929, this was one of the first novels about the Shanghai movie world. By calling it Two Stars, the, the author brought attention to the doublings that often play such a large part in his own fiction. Couples, twins, doppelgangers, often bearing uncanny resemblances to real life figures in contemporary China. Who, oh, he also expected, of course, that his movie, that his novel would someday be reproduced in the medium of film. He, he even declared in the open pages of his story, quote, if in future someone films this story and puts it out as a movie, it would make a fascinating romance of the silver screen. And indeed, that's exactly what happened two years later when it got adapted uh, by the, into a screenplay by Zhu Shirlian for the Lianhua Film Company. Now, for those who may not have had a chance to see the film screening the other day, the plot of Two Stars tracks the rise and fall of a movie star named Li Yue Ying, uh, the young, young, young woman in this picture. At the beginning of the film, Miss Lee is living in the Blake, a beautiful lakeside cottage with her father. He's a composer and she's a marvelous singer. Nearby, some cast and crew members from Yin Han Film Company, uh, that's this fictional film company inside the film, are shooting on location when they, when they hear her melodies. Now I'm going to play a clip for you and let's hope that this works.
So you can see that they use the intertitles here as well as having music accompanying the film. Okay. So the, the, uh, after, after the filmmakers dis discover her, they find out that she's going to be appearing in a benefit show. And after seeing how exquisitely she dances in this show, they convince the Shanghai Movie Studio to recruit her for their next picture. And Miss, Miss Lee gets cast in the lead. Uh, in their new romantic opera film based on the famous love story between the Tang emperor, Dynasty Emperor Ming Huang and his favorite singing concubine Mei Fei. On the set, Li takes her role as concubine Mei so seriously and even falls in love with her male co-star playing the emperor, uh, Yang Yiyun. The opera, movie star, the opera movie becomes a big hit, and the ideal mo modern couple become uh, the talk of the town, taking a, the day off at the Cathay Sports Club uh, and dancing the tango before their admiring colleagues. But their romance is doomed by Yang's ties to other women, and in the end, Miss Lee leaves him and the movie business altogether. And now this basic plot line more or less matched the original story. Uh, I, there are also some significant areas of difference where the adaptation departed from the original. And um, I talk about that more in the written piece. And certainly, if you're interested, feel free to ask later on. But what made the film two stars in the original novel exceptional and distinct from so many others in the genre was the degree to which it was so self-reflexive and engaged with the frontline concerns of filmmakers at the time. If metafilms explain the medium of film, putting the camera on display and rendering the technology as part of the spectacle, then two stars enhanced these self-reflexive qualities even further by magnifying the doublings of Zhang's original novel, by employing the cast and crew whose experience often closely resembled real life figures in the film world, and by introducing a plot for the film within the film that mirrors the larger narrative. Even the film company within the film, called Yin Han, was modeled on the Lianhua Film Company, or at least an idealized vision of the Lianhua Film Company. The fictional and real studios shared the same goal of producing chi Chinese sound films, and the film Two Stars even featured Lianhua filmmakers in brief cameo roles as themselves. Along with narrative doublings, Two Stars played on the relationships between various media, fiction and film, art and life, and other things besides media, art and life, stage and screen, silent and sound film, opera and film, players and play, motion pictures, and still photography. And it grappled with some of the broader ten tensions in contemporary culture, commerce and art, tradition and modernity, China and the West, men and women, filial obligation, and romantic love. In Two Stars, the ground constantly shifts between these dualities, with, which become layered, interwoven, and complicated, foregrounding a consciousness of the film medium Two stars prompts the spectator to consider who is behind the camera. Crucially, the film Two Stars, like the novel it was based on, was constructed around the theme of mirrorings between art and life. And in turn, the characters themselves mirrored real life figures in Shanghai's entertainment world. The father and daughter characters in the film, uh, who you see up here on the top left, Li Xu Dong and Li Yue Ying, paralleled the famous real-life father-daughter musical team in 1920s China, Li Jinhui and Li Minghui, who were popular in the late 1920s when Zhang Hanshui was writing his novel and when this film was being made. Li Jinhui was a modern comp composer and impresario who famously amalgamated Chinese and Western pop music. He ran a chorus line that included his talented daughter, uh, who was a teenager at a time, Li, Li, Li Minghui. Uh, and she became a stage sensation in China and overseas. She made dozens of gramophone records and uh, nine, at least nine silent films. 
Now, Two Stars was an early production from the new, Li new Lianhua company, and the studio head, Luo Mingyo, was actively involved in the casting because he wanted to develop a roster of stars, including stars who could sing in musicals. It would have made sense for him to cast Li Minghui in the role, but she was actually on a hiatus from movie acting at this point. So he did hire Li Jinhui and his entire song and dance troupe. Uh, he heard, he'd heard them perform in Hong Kong in 19, around 1930 after they had come back from a successful tour of Southeast Asia. Law decided to take them on as an in-house song and dance troupe. And this was actually something that Hollywood studios were doing a lot of at the time. And it was also a sort of convenient promotional, uh, served a promotional function as well. Uh, he renamed the group that Li Jinhui ran, the Lianhua Song and Dance Troupe, uh, or in English, uh, they were known as the UPS Follies, which stood for United Photo Play Service Follies. Li, Ming, Li Jinhui's daughter, Li Minghui, was actually, even though she wasn't uh, in the movie, she was hired to coach the group. Uh, and uh, Li Jinhui was featured prominently in the film's credits. And if you're actually interested in Li Jinhui and uh, Li Minghui, there's a fascinating account in this wonderful book called Yellow Music by Andrew Jones about the Chinese Jazz Age. So uh, you could find more out about them there. Uh, here you see this is a Lianhua Magazine uh, advertisement for uh, the Follies and the stars in the Follies. For the lead role of Li Yue Ying then, uh, Luo Mingyo selected one of the talented young performers from the troupe. Her name was Zi Luo Lan, and she went by the English name Violet Wong. Uh, Zi Luo Lan literally means Violet. Uh, apparently, her own experiences were so similar to those of the character she played as a, quote, innocent young protagonist who gains fame through her distinctive singing and dancing, unquote. And that's actually the script writer who wrote that. Uh, he found that people actually, uh, because of that, thought that readers of Zhang Hanchui's novel uh, believed Zi Luo Lan was actually the source for the character and that the character was modeled on her. Even her stage name, Zi Luo Lan, was the same as the name of a magazine called Zi Luo Lan that often published popular fiction by Zhang Hanshui. And in fact, this is a copy of the Zulolan magazine, which was called the, the Violet. This was a special issue that was devoted entirely to this young actress named Zulolan. So here we see already that even in the casting, the filmmakers played on all kinds of resonances between the fictional narrative and the real life figures in the movie world. The film Two Stars dramatized the intertwined development of stage and screen in the 1920s and 30s, marked as a cultural interplay between East and West. The sense of cultural hybridity was reinforced through the credits and intertitles, which were presented bilingually in Chinese and English on cards depicting Chinese motifs superimposed on foreign patterns. And if you look very closely here at the top left, uh, you can see uh, that there's a small image, I don't know, the cursor doesn't show here, but you can see behind the word stars, there's a small pavilion, uh, very pale, barely visible against that tartan background mixed in. And uh, in another shot, in the background, you see a little bust of Beethoven, and there it's also shown in an isolated shot very quickly at one point. So we see here the intertitles and the mise-en-scene calling attention to the Occidental and Chinese blend that audiences would have recognized as Li Jinhui's trademark fusion of Chinese folk songs and Western music. As in the novel, and as with the experience of real-life actresses Li Minghui and Zi Lan, the character Li Yue Ying's talents in singing and dancing eventually lead her to movie stardom. And in the longer piece, I talk about some of the things that happen. This is fascinating, the, the country and city settings of the film, uh, these musical scenes that are inserted into uh, the, the film early on, where she does a stage show uh, with an Egyptian dance. Um, but here, I'll just point out that uh, this kind of star is born plot that's developing and the stage shows within the film are key examples of the way that the film blended Chinese and Western practices uh, in filmmaking uh, that were popular in the 20s and 30s. 
In fact, uh, I found evidence that Zhang Hanshui and Lianhua drew, upon, drew some inspiration for Two Stars from the 1928 film, American film Show People, which had run in China under the title uh, Romance of the Silver Screen, or Yinxing Yan Shi. This was around the time when Zhang Hanshui was writing the original novel, and there are some noticeable parallels between the plots. Show People told the story of a southern belle named Peggy Pepper. Uh, she changes it to Peggy Pepoir at one point. Uh, she arrives in Hollywood with her father, hoping for a chance at a movie career. She meets ma famous actors and directors, and ultimately stars in a film directed by King Vidor, who is actually the director of the film, Show People, playing himself within the film. The studio where Peggy gets her first break is called Comet Studios, neatly analogized in two stars as Yin Han or Milky Way Studios. In both show people and two stars, the female protagonist falls in love with her male co-star, and both films, silent accompanied by musical soundtracks, show the behind the scenes process of filmmaking, putting direction, crew, camera and lighting equipment, and props on display. When Lianhua released its film in 1931, the, student ev the studio even invoked the comparison in its own company magazine, calling two stars China's show people. Press releases, advertising, and film reviews billed two stars as Lianhua's first sound film, enumerating the various musical tracks within the film. Still, I found at least one viewer felt shortchanged by this and thought that they were you know, going to see a full talking picture and uh, didn't get any spoken dialogue and were disappointed. Uh, but others had high praise for the music in the film. And the studio head, Luo Mingyo, justified the decision to make Two Stars as a partial sound film, uh, noting that silent intertitles would enable audiences in distant locales to follow the meaning of the film whether they you know, spoke various dialects or different languages, they would have English or Chinese characters there. Uh, while the expertly performed music uh, could move and affect people even more broadly and directly than words. Calling attention to the links between the technology, industry, and art of music recording and cinema, the centerpiece of two stars depicted the process of filming a motion picture. The choice of form was significant. This was a Cantonese opera film, a distinctly Chinese genre of motion picture that capitalized on the popularity of historical drama in Chinese silent cinema and the Cantonese operas that were all the rage on Shanghai stages in the 1920s and 30s. New sound technology offered the opportunity to bring these classic operas to the screen, complete with their dimensions of song and music. Now, it's worth keeping in mind that even though the sung drama seems like an indigenous, old-fashioned medium, interestingly enough, during the early 20th century, uh, Cantonese Shang opera in Shanghai routinely uh, blended both traditional stories and instruments and diverse new in influences, including Western music, uh, backdrops, props, even film elements as well. So in this sense, Lianhua film, Lianhua film Two Stars and the historical drama within it, uh, this one that pictured here, Love Sorrow, uh, were participating in kind of ongoing experiments to bring together stage and screen opera and film. In Two Stars, the opera film is, of course, embedded within a larger film narrative set in present day Shanghai, a technique that allowed the film to feed the growing appetite for contemporary urban melodramas in the early 1930s. Now, movie-going audiences in 1931 will have already been familiar with the tragic story of concubine May enacted in Love's, cha Love's Sorrow in the Eastern Chamber. This was a fragment of the many tales told about the 8th century Tang Emperor Minghuang and, the co and his romantic exploits, which included the rise to fame of his favorite love concubine May, uh, his subsequent desertion of May for his next great love, precious concubine Yang, also known as Yang Guifei. The jealousy and conflict between the two women, the despair and suicide of concubine May, the mysterious death of concubine Yang in the Ang Lushan Rebellion, and eventually the emperor's everlasting grief at losing precious concubine Yang. 
And all of these dramatic stories were immortalized in literature, art, and theater, perhaps uh, most famously by the poet Bai Ju Yi uh, in, a, in a poem called Chang Han Ge, or The Song of Everlasting Regret. And I'm going to show you a brief clip here from this part of the film. I think it's interesting that the musical genre and the historical mise-en-scene here and this very long duration of the film within the film uh, clearly stand apart from the very naturalistic mode elsewhere in the rest of the film and the very modern setting elsewhere. So this scene, you can hear, it goes on for a full 10 minutes this way, but um, in the original, there would have been uh, the original recorded music, Cantonese opera. Uh, but I sort of gleaned from sources the meaning of some of this, this, this film. Uh, it has a very sorrowful tone, a gently paced musical exposition, long takes and dissolves, uh, that also contrast with the cheerful optimism and uh, faster editing of the film up to this point. With a female figure singing in isolation, the focus is on the talents of the fictional actress Li Yue Ying, playing concubine Mei, and by extension, the talents of the real life actress Zi Luolan, playing Li Yue Ying. And in fact, the movie studio published all kinds of uh, articles praising the magnetic aura of Zilolan and, and her, her, her special singing technique and musical talents. Uh, so this was a kind of uh, star vehicle for her as well. Because the story of Concubine May was a story about the attractive power of song, it was a meaningful choice for Lianhua's first sound film. And because the story of Concubine May uh, and her rise from being a country girl to the emperor's concubine was a kind of star is born tale, the historical opera offered a fascinating parallel with the present day character playing her adding to the sense of constantly shifting ground in this metafilm. Here's another clip. And finally, be, I, I, I'll talk over this because there's no more singing. Finally, because Concubine's May's story ultimately ends in tragedy, the opera creates a sense of foreboding in the broader film. If a romance like the one between concubine Mei and the Tang Emperor ensues between Li Yueying and Yang Yiyun, will Li later be deserted by her co-star Yang uh, and left to sing alone with a, of her sadness? Will the modern woman be a victim of the same tragic ending or will she find a new path? Concubine May's sorrowful song adds a sense of anxiety and foreboding to the remainder of two stars. At the conclusion of Love's Sorrow scene, past and present converge. From the deserted concubine May, the camera pulls back to present a closing sh long shot of the palace garden set, and then pulls back even further to reveal Ian Han Film Company in the process of filming the opera. You see this reverse shot uh, on the crew showing director Wang, played by Wang Tsilong, standing alongside his cameraman supervising the final moments of Love's Sorrow with great satisfaction. In a momentary overlay of past and present, Love's Sorrow is shown to be an old story being reconstructed for modern film. 
when the camera of the fictional director, Wang, is revealed, we become conscious of another invisible presence, the camera of director Shi Dongshan shooting this entire scene for Lianhua. After director Wang's shouted cut, the film's tone and pace immediately have shifted from the individual personal lament of the historical opera back to the rapid collective effort and technological expertise of industrial production methods and filmmaking. And in the long shot of the classical imperial garden, the historical sets now framed by modern lighting, camera, and equipment uh, of the Yan Han studio. And we see the makeup crew and the photographers rushing toward Li and Yang uh, to shoot some production stills of the two leads in their costumes. So uh, while this is coming up, I'll mention that uh, once Li Yue Ying and Yang Yun uh, return to their adjoining dressing rooms after performing their romantic sad scene, uh, they receive copies of this uh, sort of production still that they've just posed for, showing their two costumed figures standing side by side. And we see a kind of contrast between past and present. Um, up until this point, it seems like there's been a very clear contrast, uh, and that seems to be reinforced by their receipt of these photographs, where now the past is framed inside the, the frame of the photo. The opera and the characters uh, in their costumes are, after all, an artifice or a construct, the work of professionals. The film is still, uh, the film still of the actors in their roles is simply a publicity shot. In the larger narrative, perhaps this might be reassuring. The tragic story of Concubine May is but a performance by actors set in another time that looks distinctly different from the present day reality. As a self-reflexive film about filmmaking, Two Stars presents us with an infinitely hall, uh, recurring hall of mirrors, a kind of mise en abîme. Two Stars exposes the apparatus, showing how it helps uh, create this fictional world. In displaying the camera and showing the, and, and the crew mediating between stage and screen, Two Stars was markedly different from most other Chinese opera films at this time. Uh, while all the other major Chinese studios in the late 1920s and early 30s, uh, Lianhua, Mingxing, and Tianyi, uh, heavily publicized the achievements of their sound films and used opera segments to draw in local audiences, Lianhua took the rare step of incorporating the film production process and technology itself into the frame, presenting opera as an integral part of Chinese modernity. And uh, let's just see if we can. So now we have a blank screen. A look of modernity is reasserted in the two scenes after Yin Han Film Company wraps up the filming of Love Sorrow. The characters move through an array of, of spaces of leisure activities and the latest fashions that seem like stark contrast with the Imperial Palace set where they've just performed. But they're just as dazzling and playful, these locations, and a closer look at them reveals that each of these scenes contains uncanny details and miniaturizations from the historical opera, reinforcing key themes of in the film of life mirroring art, or in, sometimes, in some cases, the question of whether life will depart from art. Uh, now, there are a lot of possible details one could comment on here, but today I'll just talk about two uh, scenes briefly in the film. Uh, the first one uh, is a lively miniature golf scene. If you've seen the film, uh, you, you recall this as a kind of amusing instance of uh, doubling. This scene does some interesting things. It, removes, it moves the romantic narrative forward uh, while recursively referring back to the historical drama of the previous opera scene.
And I guess what you could say is that this kind of uh, miniature golf course is presented as a kind of synecdoche for the film set, perhaps, and even for the nation, populated by Chinese filmmakers wending their way along the path that's punctuated with Chinese and Western design elements, inspired by traditional gardens and architectural forms. And then we see, of course, this kind of incident here. Uh, the challenger, vampire Twinping, as she's called in the movie, vampish woman. Uh, they're getting ready to duke it out. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> let's see. Even as the placement of these kinds of motifs of the traditional gardens and the architectural forms uh, might seem like a kind of uh, sort of um, kind of synecdoche for this film set, even the modern nation, uh, you see that the placement of them in the miniature golf course renders them as kitsch. The quaint icons of old China and Treaty Port Shanghai, a pagoda here, a steeple there, are shrunken in scale, clustered together, compressed and frozen in time. No foreigners or emperors rule here. In this fantasy Cathay Club tableau, the terrain is reclaimed by the stylish modern Chinese filmmakers who freely roam it. And again, when we see the approach of this uh, female figure, Chun Peng, uh, we're reminded of the triangle in the, uh, that's established in the historical opera, Love Sorrow, where concubine May laments that the emperor's attentions have turned to this sort of strange interloper figure, concubine Yang. Love Sorrow focuses our sympathies on concubine May, and now as Li Yue Ying turns into a modern day double for the historical character we, she plays, we're prompted to worry, wonder about uh, her co-star, the male protagonist, and his sincerity. The pr intriguing backdrop, part location, part constructed set, solicits the film viewer's attention and concentrates the impact of the scene as a narrative turning point halfway through the film. The constructed artifice of contemporary urban leisure appears to mirror the historical opera film space, adding another metafilmic layer to two stars. What begins as a playful, even frivolous game, now becomes ominous as the two stars uneasil uneasily align with the characters they play, as life imitates art, and as the present converges with the past. A glamorous gala scene in the film similarly contributed to the metafilmic quality of two stars and also served as publicity for Ch Lianhua's talent roster. Here and elsewhere in the film, the Lianhua actresses Chen Yanyan, Wang Renmei, Zhou Wenzhu, Tang Tianxiu, Li 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 appear in small cameo roles playing themselves and we get a glimpse of some of Lianhua's key directors and cameramen including Cai Chusheng. Uh, Sun Yu, who's up here on the left of the top picture, Wang Zilong, Zhou Ke, and Huang Chaofen. While their appearances within the film were subtle and brief, they're billed in the film's opening credits as honorary guests, as if to challenge film, make, film, make, film goers to an amusing game of star spotting. Lianhua's Shadow Play magazine, Ying Xi Zha Zhi, Likewise, a called attention to the real life personalities appearing in the film, and once again compared this aspect of two stars to the American picture, Show People, a film in which uh, MGM featured its own directors and stars as themselves in several screen scenes, most prominently a luncheon at the studio canteen, which sort of tracks through a long table where people are having lunch and you see Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and Peggy Pepper is played by Marion Davies and you have all of these MGM stars lined up. 
The original novel of Two Stars by Zhang Hunshui had itself pl dropped plenty of Hollywood names. Zhang Hunshui mentions Lillian Gish, Dorothy Gish, and Mary Pickford as figures that the character Li Yueying idolizes and copies. But Lianhua's film rendition shifted the emphasis a bit. Two stars presented Li Yue Ying as innately talented, and no foreigners appear in the film. So even as the film deliberately invoked the style of glamour and stardom found in American films like Show People, Lianhua Lian emphatically turned the focus to Chinese actors and filmmakers making Chinese films. These two scenes at the Cathay Sports Club in the gala are emphatically modern, even as they contain details that remind us of the historical opera, as if suggesting that the co contemporary figures will reenact not only the famous romance of the past, but also perhaps its tragic ending of abandonment. Audiences who had read Zhang Hanshui's book would certainly have this expectation, since Yang Yun, the male lead in the novel, eventually abandons the, the, the young woman Li Yue Ying for a courtesan named Twinping. However, the 1931 film takes another approach and reveals a, to us at the end of the ballroom scene, the gala, uh, a surprisingly different reason for Yang Yun's mysterious anxieties when we learn that he already has a wife. Now here in the longer paper I, talk, paper I talk about this, how this male character is presented in the film as much more sympathetic than he is in the novel. Uh, the film uses various devices including these still photographs and special effects to show his memories and angst. He actually turns the page from gazing at the publicity still longingly of himself and Li Yue Ying and reveals another photograph which is his country wife arranged for him by his parents. So he can't resolve this conflict between his love for Miss Lee and his duty to his parents and the marriage that they arranged for him. He actually has a kind of strange dream sequence, you know, sort of flashback to his mother telling him never to part from the woman who they've uh, arranged for him to be married to. Ultimately, the modern couple's relationship is doomed and Miss Lee mo leaves the movie business returning to the countryside. The screen adaptation of Two Stars was a kind of metafilm that staged, as it were, the self-knowledge of film. By invoking the self-reflexive qualities of Zhang Hunshui's original novel, and then adding new episodes, like the opera filming scene, the miniature golf game, and the ballroom gala, uh, these were all not in the original novel. Two Stars explored the capabilities and limitations of cinema. In fact, Lianhua filmmakers added to the original story another important scene to the film, which explains directly to the, to the spectator what Chinese films should be. This scene takes place very early in the film. And here comes a clip. And you can see this expository title boldly announces a shift in locale away from the countryside where the filmmakers had been filming before this shot and uh, into a modern production site. The painting of that film studio backlot, which is on the wall of their boardroom, gives us this kind of aerial view of the industrial soundstage buildings. And you see here uh, these very long intertitles <laughs> explaining
Okay. So you can see here that this scene asserts the importance of movie studios as enterprises that can help uh, in the struggle to save the nation. As Mr. Hua speaks, he's presented in frontal shots as if directly addressing the camera, breaking down the fourth wall and soliciting our attention. And I think it's worth pointing out that the English intertitles broadly refer to artistic standards here, while the Chinese intertitles explicitly call upon filmmakers and by extension the ch film's Chinese spectators to strive toward a, quote, proper artistic track and uh, commit themselves to the front line of arts revolutionaries. You can see the word gaming in there, right? <laughs> revolutionaries, that's not mentioned in the English titles. Uh, it's more about artistic standards. The film suggests that if the mission of Chinese cinema is to propagate the virtues of our people, the project of filming the historical opera Love, Sorrow in the Eastern Chamber suggests that one way to achieve the company's goal is to touch base with China's own indigenous past and its stories. In fact, Chinese uh, costume opera films in the 1920s were often celebrated as a positive phenomenon that could offset over-Westernization and set the stage for an economic and cultural regeneration of Chinese films as national products, or guochan ying pian. Even so, the film company wasn't afraid of using foreign technologies or models domesticated with a Chinese twist to promote its business. After all, the two stars' film protagonists, Li Yueying and her father, Li Xudong, like their counterparts in Zhang Hanshui's novel, have a kind of hybrid cultural orientation that the film celebrates. And Lianhua's publicity called attention to the parallels with MGM's show people. And you can see that uh, Lianhua Company even styled a lot of its advertising on MGM's, highlighting the roster of stars, you can see both of them did that, right? Here's the Lianhua ad on the right. Here's the Metro Golden Wire ad on the left, published in Chinese magazines. Uh, they both enclose their stars, uh, but the Lianhua ad, ad uh, includes some patriotic motifs. Can you see them at the top? The airplanes, right? And pictures of soldiers at the bottom as well, and even their logo had a picture of an airplane and a life preserver, surrounded by a life preserver, saving the nation. Structurally, two stars shifts between the dualities of East and West, Chinese and foreign, tradition and modernity, presenting Cantonese opera in the opening sort scene, uh, Cantonese music, sorry, where she's singing in the open scene, then moving to a Western style studio boardroom and stage show, then into a Chinese costume opera film, then returning to a modern film set, the Cathay Club mini golf and Western ballroom dancing, then playing the Cantonese soundtrack through a wireless radio, a subsequent scene in the film. And finally, back to the photographic reminders of filial duty and at the very end, more sounds of Cantonese music come with the closing. The film negotiates between the promises of modern media and anxieties about foreign cultural values. It celebrates and interrogates local forms and traditions, offering up Cantonese music, filial piety, and parallel romances in the historical opera and modern film plot. These may offer some kind of sense of cultural continuity with the past, yet the painful outcomes uh, of the, for the protagonists are um, something that the film never lets us forget, the kind of human cost of up upholding those traditions. It keeps us fully aware of the complications and nuances of the issues through to the closing shot. Two Stars is arguably far more unsettling and complex than a standalone opera film or contemporary feature might have been. If, as W.J.T. Mitchell explains, Meta Pictures, quote, elicit not just a double vision, but a double voice and a double relation between language and visual experience, as if the image could speak and the words were on display, then the metafilm Two Stars did all these things and more. The uncanny recursive layers in the film displayed the uneasy tensions and anxieties for urban Chinese at a pivotal time. The film moved between the dualities of fiction and film, art and life, opera and film, 
motion pictures and still photographs, tradition, modernity, past and present, constantly blurring the lines between them. Even after the production was complete, the Lianhua Company duplicated the Love Sorrow publicity film still produced by the fictional In Han Film Company within the diegesis, and then circulated this opera still as part of the Two Stars film press kit distributed to the print media. So you can see here, this was a magazine ad that was created from uh, the press kit, which included the still that was produced ostensibly within the narrative of the film. Two Stars on the Silver Screen not only adapted a compelling Star is Born tale, rooted in the life of gifted, lives of gifted singers, whether contemporary, historical, or fictional, it also self-referentially dramatized the array of aspirations and possibilities envisioned by Chinese filmmakers themselves at a critical moment in 1931. If the metafilm prompts us to ask who is behind the camera, the answer offered by two stars is emphatic. Chinese are behind the camera. Thank you. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to respond. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, the film itself, or? Early, because I did see it, and then it just dropped, they dropped their history of their images, and they dropped the dot script with it, like, you know, talking. Uh-huh. To what day? I'm just curious, um, the history, but, um, I guess it, it just started, I don't know, just, I thought that was a good way, to, if it possibly could be used today, Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the term history in images, I guess, uh, that um, Ling Jen mentioned was the title of a book that's coming out, uh, which is being published by uh, a, a scholar named Christian Anrio, who's done some amazing work, actually. Um, he has a website called Virtual Shanghai, in which he's been collecting up uh, and digitizing uh, all kinds of archival sources, visual sources, uh, uh, from the history of Shanghai, which include, um, uh, you know, still photographs, uh, mostly um, uh, photographic images, but also maps and so forth. And um, so this this particular piece is part of that uh, project that he's been developing to. Um, try to explore how we can learn more about a place through some of the extant images that we have. And this was an experiment with trying to look at motion pictures. And it really got me thinking, as we look at this film, as a film about filmmaking, uh, what kinds of images are Chinese filmmakers at this time trying to project about Chinese cinema uh, and about what it means to, to make a film in China. In, in that time and what their aspirations were. Um, yes? Yeah, I've been fascinated that you let us hear some of this original soundtrack because last uh, Monday when I saw the movie, it was so puzzled because the soundtrack made no sense whatsoever. And there was this 10 minutes. Uh, oh, yeah. She was singing and you couldn't uh, follow it at all. So right. I was just wondering, first of all, uh, if you have uh, kind of any information about what happened. Right. The, the clips that you let us hear are they part of the original, how you found them? Uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's really been intriguing to me because as I started writing about this film, I was, what I was reading about it in some of the early sources, including periodicals that described the, the film in, in great detail, it didn't match up with the kind of lyrics that were being sung in that scene, uh, and it didn't match up with the style of the music that, that was being described. And so I started reading more and found out that um, that uh, that long opera scene, for instance, uh, I've read the lyrics of the scene. Um, the the original discs that they were they were on record discs, and they would play the record during the film. When they would cue it up to the whenever somebody started singing, you would play the record during the screening, uh, and that's how this, the 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 sound on disc system worked. So those discs are no longer extant. Uh, but the lyrics, according to the lyrics we have, um, she's singing of her sorrow at the emperor, uh, who's about his affection being alienated and, and, and starting to see this other woman, and this was leaving her all alone. She sings about her loneliness and so forth. And it's very classical language that she's singing in. Um, so that's lost. Well, you know, it's possible that uh, I'm still trying to find them. So it's possible that someplace out there, we, I might be able to find something like that. Um, and Where are you doing your research about this now? Are you like from, from China Film Archive and from uh, in Shanghai as well. Yeah. So it's hard, but you know, there's, there, I'm, I'm going back in June to do some more. So I'm hoping that Someday we'll actually be able to hear something that's more accurate. Um, this, this particular soundtrack was done by a Japanese composer. Um, it was very distressing, particularly during, well, aside from that piece of the opera, but also the tango was, was Yeah, yeah, it's not really tango music. No. <laughs> Although I've played it for, for in classes before with no sound at all, and it seems to work better than having no sound for the entire duration. I'm not sure whether you'd agree, but um, my students have found that. <laughs> but I agree, I, would, I think it would be nice to have more accurate music. So that's what I've been working on, trying to kind of reconstruct that. And, uh, um, you know, we'll see. It's, time will tell. Thank you for that question. Yes? Yeah, that would be useful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, question? Um, I was just wondering when you were talking about, you played the clip about yeah. um, when the film producers were talking about what they wanted mm. in the vision. Um, I was just, a question that I had was what does that commentary um, mean in the context of the ending of the film, which is very much tied back to traditional Chinese values of like love um, is second to duty. Yeah. And whether or not you could tie that into possible um, political stances within this film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, this film was made in a very particular time, and I'm really glad you asked that question, because 1931, if you were in China, you know, in September of 1931, uh, you would have been very aware of national politics, because um, China's equivalent, I guess, of 9-11 was 9-18, right? And this is when Manchuria was invaded by Japan. And uh, so many Chinese in, 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 in you know, certainly in the film world, were very conscious of like how was, was their work then going to mobilize people to become conscious of this issue. And in fact, what's interesting about this film was that it was in production before all that happened, but was still being produced after 918. And so what wound up happening was that you could see them insert these, you can see this is a quite different style of scene, just plopped into the film almost. Uh, and elsewhere, another example of that, which I think indicates to us that the films were trying, the filmmakers were trying to make their, their films suddenly more relevant in these newly sort of patriotic, 
times was there these two kind of stage shows, if you remember, early on in the film, when she's being discovered, they go to watch a kind of charity performance or benefit performance that she's playing in, and there's, there's a kind of scene that doesn't seem to make sense with the rest of the film, where you get these sort of majorettes uh, chorus line, it's the Lianhua UPS Follies, right? But they're doing a dance in soldiers uniforms and the sign that's put down, put put next to the stage says Hong Sun Niang, oh no, it says Niang Zijun, uh, not red detachment of women, but women's detachment, right? So again, uh, and the song that was played during that was a song by Li Jinhui, we can't hear it because it's not on this track, but it was a song called Strive Nu Li, Right to work hard, right to strive for better, better things, and so these that scene in this one where we see this kind of emphasis on making films that will strengthen China, basically, um, I think are in part a result of that moment when this film was made. So I'm glad you asked that question because I had to cut that part out of the long paper, so now I got to say it, um, and uh, it's it's it, it's certainly something that other film companies did with the other productions they were making around that time too, as they were all sort of scrambling to, you know, suddenly explain why they're making a happy romance at a time of national tragedy, right? So they would build in something at the end, you know, where somebody would be kind of suffering and then they would say, I have to go save the nation. <laughs> other questions, anything else? Yeah? Oh, I was just, I was just okay. thinking, well, we also have revolutionary Russia and revolutionary China mm -hmm. at the same time. And I was wondering if this whole idea of a meta film, was it all being played with within revolutionary circles and, and yeah. the Union, and then how that was picked up in, in Shanghai, where mm -hmm. you have the, you know, the massacre of communists in Shanghai in the late, right. late 20s, and, and I, I just thought, I mean, a Japanese presence there as well. And Absolutely. So, Yeah. Um, no, I'm no, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, the um, because certainly there were people in China at that time in 1931, more in 32, 33, 34, who were watch, who were reading a lot about Soviet cinema, and also very conscious of developments in Japanese cinema at that time. And you know, we're conscious of films like The Man with the Movie Camera and other films that would have had a kind of, um, you know, layered uh, effect, films about, about filmmaking as well. Uh, and so they were trying to incorporate some of those practices into their films. The particular people who were involved with this production were not on that end of the political spectrum so much. But what's really interesting about this film, I think, is that it's almost like a collage in some ways. You've got you know, the, the, the sort of classical opera film, and you've got these sort of modern stage shows with the song and dance troupe, with a very Hollywood style to it, and then you've got those patriotic elements built in. Um, and I think that itself mirrors the way that this particular film company was constituted. It was originally a series of lots of separate companies that uh, combined together. And they each had different specializations and different styles. So it was a clever way to create a big film company at a time when the little ones were having trouble surviving. So when they banded together and formed Lianhua, which literally means United China, uh, they then had all of these different kinds of specializations. And you can see in a film like this, it's almost a kind of collage of those different uh, specializations. And so, the, while the main people who were involved in this, you know, sort of the, the script writer, the director, the set designer, and so forth, tended to be uh, sort of mainly on, I guess we could say, the entertainment film wing of the spectrum rather than the political film uh, wing. Um, I think that they were all interacting and were conscious of developments in the film world at that time. And you see within a few years that there is a kind of politicization, especially after 918 of filmmaking after that. So thanks for that question. Ah, yes. 
see you behind your Mac. There we go. Um, I have a quick question um, about the concept of the Christian Church and the Catholic Church. Um, because I think Great. Those are both really interesting questions. I'll, I'll answer the latter question first. Uh, the English was uh, original to the film, and it was common at this time for uh, silent Chinese films uh, to include bilingual intertitles, especially for a Lianhua Film Company during these years, because Lianhua and the producer, Liu Mingyo, uh, had these aspirations to reaching audiences not just inside of China but also overseas and he especially had his eyes on Southeast Asia at the time where there were people who didn't necessarily read Chinese but they may have been of Chinese heritage wanted to see Chinese films or maybe they weren't even of Chinese heritage and so and they might be able to read English for example in Malaya right and uh, and even farther overseas. So it gave a cosmopolitan look to the film, whether or not it, they were actually being used. Um, but uh, you could see that they're, they're, they're quite elegant at times. Every now and then, you know, they, 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 they depart from the, the, the strict meaning of the Chinese, but they are original to the film. Um, as for the meta film staging, or meta picture staging its own self-knowledge, of course, I think that there's this, there's this kind of infinitely recurring hall of mirrors going on, right? Because it's, it's staging a self-knowledge, which is a self-knowledge of, of staging, <laughs> of construct, of something being a construct. And so um, I think that's what makes Hunter Stage such a fascinating film, right? Because he keeps uh, moving in and out of the past. And in fact, in the longer, I think you saw the, the, the cut that was released in 1992, right? When he made that film, um, it was about three or four years he spent making it, from about 1988, 89, up until 1990, end of 1991, he finished it, and it was released in 92. He actually made two cuts. He made a, lo a longer film that was about a half hour longer, um, and he made this one that you saw. And they released this one uh, because they thought it would make more sense to audiences. And the director's cut sat on the shelf until, 19, until 2005. It was just released, I don't know if it was because 2005 was the 100th anniversary of Chinese cinema, all these celebrations, or whether it just happened that in 2005 they decided to bring it out. But uh, it was digitally remastered, it was released uh, with this extra half hour, which is not just sort of an extra half hour at the end, but there are small sort of pieces woven into the film at various points that were cut out of the, the shorter 1992 version. And actually the shot that I showed you at the very beginning of the presentation where Maggie Chung takes a breath and, 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 um, and they're filming the, uh, here it is. Oh, there we go. These shots here, this bottom one, for example, all of these were in the original director's cut but they were cut out of the 
the release in 1992. Um, and you could say that this was very metafilmic in uh, trying to record how they were trying to reconstruct this life and this narrative. Um, and, you know, her taking a breath at the end, uh, and then the film cutting to this picture of Ron Ling Yu lying on her, uh, I guess her sort of wake, her in her wake. Um, I think sets the present apart from the past more than the original film perhaps did. And I know that Stanley Kwan, when he made the film, said that what struck him was how different the past was from the present and how inaccessible it felt and how, um, how in many ways you wouldn't want to necessarily go back to that past, right? And uh, so does that answer your question? It's worth watching the other part, the other, the other film uh, to see how they differ. But, um, but some of the things that they, ch they changed for the 1992 release also involved um, color use in the film because you'll recall that there were black and white scenes and then there were some uh, reconstructions that were done in color and uh, it was determined from the longer director's cut that there, the shifts in color were too confusing. Um, Rightly or wrongly, I see what you see what you think when you, um, when if you watch the other one, if uh, if they're confusing or not. I think both versions are good, um, and it's you know it's true that this scene is fascinating, but there are other scenes like it in the original film where they're where they're where they're doing similar things, so they accomplish much of the same thing. Thank you very much, and uh, for my students, 